Let's start with my main event, which is Piotr Jan versus Corey Sandhagen. Been doing a lot of work on Piotr Jan. Sort of skipped over Corey Sandhagen in the process, but Sandhagen in him, Sandhagen, whatever you want to call him, uh, in, in his own right, is coming off a really good fight against TJ Dillashaw. Did lose that fight, but uh, was it was great, and he just knocked out um, Frankie Edgar and Marlon Marais back to back. Obviously, those two guys are on a bit of a downfall, but. Yes, uh, you know, the TJ Dillashaw one was actually a step forward in my mind because he did so well uh, dealing with the takedowns and um, grappling his way up. And yeah, no, he did still get taken down and that got TJ back in the fight, but uh, he blew out TJ's knee with a heel hook. You know, that's that's, that's not a bad thing, you know. Uh, I, I, and it, the more I think about it, the more like, I, I think you have to be impressed by what Aljo did against Sanhag- Sanhagen more than you're like, Oh, you know, Corey Sanhagen, if you touch his legs, he just dies. You know, it's, it's not the case. You know, he's been doing great work against guys like uh, Lineker um, and, uh, you know, people who've been grabbing his legs plenty. You know, it's just he got caught and it was a it was a very slick back take straight to the straight to the neck. If you watch um, Sterling's hands, I mean, one of the big things about finishing from the back is that it, there's sort of two philosophies about it. So there's people like Gordon Ryan who say, like, the longer you're on the back, you know, the the more likely you are to finish someone but uh, there's also something to like the Marcelo Garcia attitude and uh, I, I've heard Josh Barnett say it before and a few other guys but like you will get the choke in the instant that you're getting on the back and if you don't you've got work to do you know that's when guys will fight your hands tie you up uh, and eventually either escape or just stall you out get the hand under the chin immediately is the secret because guys are still working on whatever you're doing to get on their back uh, instead of thinking about like shit, I need to fight his hands, and that's what Sterling was able to do against Sandhagen that uh, in that fight. He, he moved so fast. What was the total time for that fight? Hold on. Oh, one twenty-eight is yeah. So it, it wasn't as quick as I remember it being because I remember it being like back choke. <laughs> but but he did they did roll around a little bit before then. But um, obviously a completely different fight. Like you know, as as well rounded as Piotr Jan is. He's a, a very different fighter to Aljamain Sterling. Corey Sanhagen is a very different fighter to Aljamain Sterling as well. Um, you know, I think a, a few people have pointed out that Aljo did have good success in the first couple of rounds, spazzing out of Piotian, but he did find a couple of things that really do work against Piotian. Um, Low kicks, body kicks, pushing him backwards, body shots with the hands. You know, Aljo has these weird, like, slow motion punches that he throws. Um, but Corey Sanhagen... One of the best body punches in MMA right now, particularly with the jab to the to the uh, left hook to the body, the, the my Max Holloway favorite. But now Corey Sanhagen is probably better, or a, you know a more frequent exponent of it. Um, but I really like that because so much of Piotr Jan's game is the cover up, the the crunch, the head over, and and the high forearms guard, and then come back. You know, he's not an elusive fighter by any means. He's a uh, a ridiculously tough guy who then gets on offense. Um, so things like the the jab to the uh, body hook are a great idea. And also just to see how Sanhagen's volume affects him because Aljamain Sterling, you know, he got Jan to cover up and be on the back foot by spazzing out for the first two rounds. And, and then even for like periods of the, the third and fourth, he was able to get going forward because he just did it with, with um, aggression. But Sanhagen is very good at like keeping people on guard and keeping their hands up with the jab and the short um, right hand or the left straight, whichever stance he's in. But just um, poking pot shots. You know, like if you watch the Lineker fight, he's just pumping out the jab constantly, flicking it in, not like trying to jack his head back every time, but doing enough that Lineker has to do something about it. Because it's the thing, like Lineker has an amazing chin, but you can't just ignore jabs because if they're good and they're going in on your eyes... They're blinding you to a possible right hand that could come at any moment. You know, if you watch um, Lineker versus, uh, I think it was Dodson, where his eye gets swelled shut and then Dodson chins him and wobbles him. And it's like the first time we'd ever seen Lineker wobbled because he couldn't see the punch. And that's the effect of the jab. If you don't ever, if you never move your head or parry or or duck under it or um, pull your head away from it, it's always there closing your eye for, for like half a second at a time. So if Sandhagen can use the, the jabs and the short uh, crosses to force uh, Jan into a shell fairly often, then he gets the opportunity to punch the body, to kick the body. Aldo had success with that. Um, to kick the legs. Uh, switch, uh, start switches very well, so he can work to whatever Jan's got forward. Uh, and the way that that works is like, if you're in a 
open stance, you want to kick the body in the head. Uh, and if you're in the closed stance, you want to kick the lead leg. And um, one of Sanhagen's great moves is that he'll throw, he'll poke out like a rear hand straight, whichever one's in the back. So if he's orthodox, he'll poke out a right straight and then he'll step through and convert it into a right jab. So he'll like straight and then jab afterwards, like a double jab, but with a, a shift in between. And then he'll kick with the rear leg. Um, did it to Marlon Marias a couple of times. Beautiful uh, combination. Kind of an application of like the same thing that Dustin Poirier always does and Jan himself always does, you know, shifting in to set up the third blow or the second blow in the um, whatever's after the step. Because chewing up distance is a huge part of MMA because everyone's answer is just to back up. Um, and on the subject of backing up, then you've got the other hand of it, the other side of this, which is like, Jan, yeah, Jan covers up a lot and that will expose him to um, body shots and low kicks and things if uh, Sanhagen can keep up the the um, volume with straight hitting upstairs and um, or just volume punching generally. Um, the other side of it is that obviously Jan's moving forward the entire time and ready to come back at, any, at a moment's notice, whether that's to uh, enter a clinch, whether that's to start punching, start kicking. You know, he, he's got a huge variety of tools. He'll even shoot this beautiful double leg, which I included in um, the Filthy Casuals Guide. He'll step through uh, and, and throw his head to the other side of the opponent's body and, and hit the double on the off side. And all of that's very interesting because um, Sanhagen has been good at staying off the fence, but still been pushed there, like TJ Dillashaw did a, a lot of... I mean, that was part of the... Um, when people were arguing over the decision, they were like, hey, he was just sort of holding him against the fence, and that's not really anyone's offense. Um, and of course, you know, the Aljo Sterling, uh, the Aljo uh, Sanhagen back take happened along the fence. But the intrigue in this one is that it's a pay-per-view. It's in Abu Dhabi. It's it's in the big cage. And Jan really does do fantastic work when he gets guys backing up to the fence. If you want to, I mean, watch the Dodson fight, but um, Taruto Ishihara, you know, it took him like, the first time he stepped in, when Ishihara was on the fence, he, he knocked him down. I'm probably going to understate Jan's case here because I, I've just done so much work on him with the Filthy Casual Guide. If you've not watched that, go watch it. But um, one of his great strengths is the same as Sandhagen. He, he can switch stances comfortably and he works appropriately to whatever the opponent's stance is. So it doesn't matter if he's Southpaw or, you know, it doesn't, if he's Southpaw, it doesn't matter if his opponent's Orthodox or Southpaw, he'll pick the correct thing to do against their stance rather than focus on like, um, well, if you watch people like Pat Barry or any of those early guys who switched hit in MMA, it's always like, I have a great right hook from my Southpaw stance and I have a great overhand right from my Orthodox stance and opponent's stance be damned. I just do what I can do. You know, that's how people used to look at stance switching. It was like, I've got tricks off both stances where really star switching should be, you know, you take a minimalist game from both stances like Jan has. You get, you got a, a good one too. Um, you got a good rear leg kick so you can go to the body. If it's an open guard, you can go to the legs if it's a closed guard uh, and you build from there. And, and he does have a nice step up lead leg left kick as well. So he uses that against uh, orthodox opponents when he's orthodox. Um and yeah, of course, you've got holes in your game because like you can't build a completely symmetrical game from both stances, but um, you have stuff to use against people from both stances. And the other thing that I said about switch hitting was that it allows people to to execute some problem solving. You know, um, and I think this is important when we talk, because like one of the big things for a lot of fighters has been the jab. It's so, well, it used to be so rare for a guy to have a really good jab in MMA. Fyodor Yan had a lot of trouble with Jose Aldo's jab, orthodox. Uh, tried to cross-hand check it, which is something that he does that's quite interesting, which is where if you're both orthodox, you put your left hand across to the outside of their left hand, which means that you've given up your jab and that you're also crossing yourself over so they can pull down your hand to try and hit you with right straight. But you are sort of obstructing their jab and, and giving them a weird look. And Vladimir Klitschko used to do this a lot. I think he did it in the Joshua fight. He's done it in a few fights, but um, yeah, he'll put his, like the, the he'll like left hand palm towards the opponent and then use the outside edge of his left forearm and wrist to hook onto the opponent's lead hand, like he's crossing swords with them. Um, and what, what, and one of the interesting things that will happen is that they'll start trying to pull their hand around his so that they can shoot down the inside of it because they can't really shoot over it. Um, 
And when they do, he pull it, like they'll circle their hand to the inside of his wrist, and then he'll pull it down and throw the right hand over the top. It's a really interesting little trick. It, it reminds me a lot of fencing. Uh, is it a quarto or whatever you call it, where you rotate the blade around someone's blade in fencing? I don't know. I mean, it is like a billion different styles of fencing from around the world, so it's probably got lots of different names. But um, on the subject of that, I need to get a better computer and then play Hellish Court because people keep raving about it. But anyway, yes, it's something that um, Vladimir Klitschko does, and uh, Jan was trying it against Elder and not having a lot of success, but he did it against Sterling. Um, if you watch their fight, the very first knockdown, he comes out, he checks across with the blade, outside blade of his left hand outside of um, Sterling's jab, and then Sterling pulls his hand back and tries to throw the jab again down the inside, and uh, exactly the same thing happens. Jan inside parries it with his left hand and punches him with the right straight and knocks him down. But yes, he couldn't get that going against Aldo. So what he did was he switched st- he switched stances so that he was orth- uh, sorry so that he was southpaw and uh, Aldo was orthodox still. And then his lead hand now his right hand was on top of Aldo's the entire time. So he took away the jab. And I want you to imagine like if someone had done that to GSP, if someone had been competent enough off both stances that they could go, oh, I get my well. Imagine if Josh Koscheck had the booming right hand off the orthodox stance, but also a booming left hand off southpaw. And if he'd switched to Southpaw while getting his face jabbed off and just put his lead hand on top of GSP's, you could have had the Johnny Hendricks fight a lot earlier. I mean, when I say that, people are all going to be like, oh, you know, GSP was magic. He just got old or whatever. But no, he had real trouble when he fought Southpaws who put their hand on top of his. Because obstructing something is, is, is real. It's tangible. It's a thing that happens. Like, you would then have to, to do work to jab, where before he just had to time it well. Now he has to clear the obstruction as well. But yeah, that's just a a nice little um, upside of being able to start switch competently. You can go, oh, I'm having a lot of trouble here. And you can just, um, you know, you're conceding, you're giving up some of your weapons, maybe some of your preferred weapons, but you're going, okay, fine, fuck it. I'll I'll fight like this for a while. I'm comfortable. Actually, on the subject of um, that crosshand trap, uh, uh, Jan uses it to foul the shit out of people, like he uses most things to foul the shit out of people. Um, if you don't know, Jan is an incredibly dirty fighter. It's not just this Aljo DQ. You know, it, well, take for advantage, for example, that both of his professional losses are because of his cheating. Um, the the, uh, the even if you're like, oh, he just had a brain fart against Sterling or whatever, which he didn't. He knows the rules, and especially when you watch him fight. He's so uh, creative and in the moment and aware of what's going on at all times. You know, this is a man with incredible aptitude for wrestling and um, I suppose even no-gi judo and all sorts of other things who then just like stares at the guy on the floor with his knee on the floor, holding his head down and goes, yeah, I'm going to knee him. You know, he knew the rules. Um, And the the same thing is true with his his first fight against, is it Magomed Magomedov? Very good grappler. Uh, And Jan... They they had a couple of barn burners, both of them. But the first fight, Jan loses because throughout the fight, he's been grabbing the double collar tie and posting his head on the guy, which is, you know, that's legal enough. You know, you, you will clash heads doing that, but it's legal. But he will actually pull his head back and then ram it into the guy's face right in front of the referee. Uh, and then he did it in the fifth round and got a point deduction. And all of Jan's fans, fans are like, well, if if the ref hadn't taken the point or if the ref hadn't DQ'd him, you know, you're, you're asking for the ref to be more lenient to the guy who keeps fouling. You know, if you watch, I mean, I watched all his fights from the UFC to, to make the Filthy Casuals guide, but he is a dirty fucking fighter. The John Dodson one kicked him in the groin or punched him in the, well, within seconds he punched him in the groin, which is impressive, but kicked him in the groin about three or four times in that bout. From the bottom, like he's, he's got uh, Dodson over him and he just like hoofs him in the cup. And like pushes him away by the cup, and Dodson to the ref like he just kicked me in the balls, and the ref's like, "Oh, sorry, he's up now." Um, but he grabs Dodson's hair, and this was like peak clown hair, Dodson. It was terrible. He had that like his hairline is back on the the top of his head, and he's got the full grown out afro and stuff. But he, he was grabbing the shit out of um, Dodson's hair to defend takedowns. Um, poked his eyes a ton. Like if, the, the reason I was going to say this was because when he does that cross hand. Uh, check he splays his fingers and points them right at the opponent's eyes if that poor korean guy uh who was like chan sung jun's roommate or something but he he fought uh yeah and he had a, a decent showing for not being 
uh, a particularly well-regarded fighter against a guy who everyone was like, this is the next big thing. But literally there's a clip where Jan just points his splayed fingers at this dude's eyes three or four times in a row. And then the dude comes forward and Jan just jams his fingers in his eyes. It's literally John Jones, you know, where you hold your hand out there and you're like, I'm not going to poke you, but if you run forward or if you come in, you might get poked. And he did the same to Douglas D'Andrage. Um, the, the one person he didn't foul was Jimmy Rivera, as far as I could see. Uh, he does seem to love fouling black dudes more. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, but yeah, he's a very, very dirty fighter. An excellent fighter, but a very dirty fighter. You know, um, who's that guy? Eusebio something or other. The guy, the guy Barry McGuigan beat for the title. Like, very good fighter, but loves cheating for some reason. As opposed to someone like Fritzy Zivic or Mis- uh, Mysterious Billy Wells, who basically were only good fighters because they cheated. But yeah, very compelling fight. Um, I think Sanhagen's volume should be a problem for him. The bodywork should be a problem for him. You know, Sanhagen has a lot of tools that um, brilliantly exploit guys covering up. If you watch the uh, Aldo yarn fight, Aldo has a lot of success once he switched to once Jan switched to Southpaw. Has a lot of success throwing the right kick to the body, and um, Jan. It's always been a thing like Jan probably, even if he can take a good body shot, he's very exposed to the body shots because of how he reacts to to um, his opponent's firing. You know, he does so much covering up and moving forward, and in that fight, he's very like belt and braces about it. He keeps picking up his lead leg to cross check Aldo's right kick. And it stops him from opening up as much too. But um, with Sandhagen, you've got a guy who's going to be more pat, 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 bang. You know, never been an Aldo thing. Aldo has never been a volume striker. And, you know, you can call him a lot of things, but he's never been a volume striker. And he's never been sort of like a tap, 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 bang guy. He's always been like slip and try and take your head off with a three punch combination afterwards or poke you with a really hard jab. <laughs> like there's no middle ground. He's not like... Um, there's, there's not really a lot of dynamic shifts in his striking, you know, um, like music, you know, uh, crescendo, diminuendo, all that shit. Uh, it's all forte all the time. Which is why the the secret to beating Aldo, which isn't really a secret, but I mean, for a while it was because people were like, he'd never gassed again at Dominic. He was on painkillers. Uh, he will never gas. He's got perfect gas tank. <laughs> and the, the secret has always been to drive the pace on Aldo and make him be... I think that what I said about uh, Max Holloway's performance was he made Aldo be Aldo more. He made him be more Aldo. He said, keep being Aldo. Uh, we're going we're gonna to have a nice high pace fight and you're going to do so much Jose Aldo stuff that you tire yourself out. Because Jose Aldo stuff is like pulling your head back a, 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 an instant before the strike lands and coming back with huge punches. Um, and you can't keep doing that over and over again. And lo and behold, you know, Jan um, stayed in his face and he, he really did just wear him out. I mean, the first round, he almost finished him with a great body shot on the ground. Uh, and then Aldo came back and had a storming second round. Like, the, the more I see of Aldo, the more I'm like, damn, this dude's amazing. Um, and I think this is quite interesting because people say like, well, what if prime Aldo had met Piotr Jan? And I think Aldo keeps getting better. I think, uh, you know... It, Physically, he's obviously getting worse, but I think he's getting better technically and, and learning more things. Like, we're going to have a, a side tangent about Aldo here, but in that fight with Pedro Munoz, he hit Pedro Munoz with the Chad Mendes level change uppercut. Uh, against Frankie Edgar and Pedro Munoz, he did the back step um, right... Well, it was a right straight for him. It would have been left straight for Conor McGregor, but that back skipping rear hand counter he landed that against uh, both Frankie Edgar in their second fight which is me- immediately after the, the Conor McGregor fight uh, and he landed against Pedro Munoz um, Jan got to a clinch with him in the third round I think it was or the second and freed his hands and did the spinning back elbow the next round Aldo does the same thing to him having never done that before in a fight <laughs> he's, he's a guy who just keeps growing and learning and i did you know i've recently done an advanced striking 2.0 on aldo and i said like a lot of the stuff he does seems to be dictated by whims <laughs> like, like, whatever he's enjoying at training at that moment um, ha- has affected how he's grown as a fighter and how his career has gone but anyway sorry i'm going to take um jose aldo's dick out of my mouth and uh we'll carry on talking about this fight so yeah it's quite interesting because like Yard is a, a really well-rounded threat. 
And that should be, you know, that's how TJ Dillashaw got himself back into the fight. He um, provided a rounded threat. Well, yeah, the wrestling was the main part of it, but like, I don't think just diving after his legs without uh, having a striking threat would work that well. Um, but then Aljo was not a particularly rounded threat, and he he managed to um, do the best grappling against Sanhagen we've seen so far. Um, I've seen a few guys talk about the flying knee and how interesting that is against Jan because he's giving up height, and he does just do the sort of crunch down double forearms guard that uh, will leave you exposed for that sort of thing. Um, you know, a lot of what Corey Sanning has done, he does do the odd like leaping flying knee, you know, five feet across, the, you know, uh, leaps 10 feet across the octagon sort of flying knee, uh, James Irving style. But the really effective flying knees are often just the little hop ups. If you watch him against John Lineker, he'll just jump up almost directly over where he is as Lineker's stepping in. And I think those could be really useful against Jan here. But I think on the other end of it, I think um, Jan has to go to Sanhagen's body with a guy who's so long and skinny. Uh, body shots are always a good idea, but a guy who wants to move a lot, body shots are always a good idea. The low kicks are a good idea. Jan doesn't really commit a lot to low kicks. He does have good low kicks, but um, doesn't commit to them as much as he should. He's ha He has trouble with low kicks on his own, but only when mixed with a convincing boxing game. Uh, you know, he remembers to check kicks if you're just showing him kicks. Like, uh, Jimmy Rivera when he was just trying to kick wouldn't have much success but what Jimmy Rivera did really well like for a guy who doesn't have a lot of knockouts on his record he managed to get Jan to respect his hands quite convincingly you know he, Jan stepped in he hit him with a couple of counters and then every time Jan stepped in Jan was you know he wasn't scared of stepping in but he was really giving it the thought that it deserved and the caution that it deserved and in the course of just getting engaged in a boxing match and also Jan um, Rivera was threatening to take him down if he stepped in too, too aggressively as well. He, he was adopting clinches and throwing Jan around, which is a real change to how Jan's been fighting lately, where he's just been ragdolling everyone else. Um, and in the course of this uh, inside fight where, where every step in was meted with counters, with, sorry, was meted, was met with counters or takedown attempts, uh, Jan's legs just became exposed. You know, he, if you're just... Jose Aldo standing at kicking range and you're threatening to kick, he's got a lot more chance of moving his leg out of the way or checking. Um, if you get him into a good boxing match, you've got a much better chance of kicking him in the legs for free. So I think this is a really good fight. And the other thing I'd love to see against uh, Piotr Jan um, is elbows, because elbows are always a great answer to a folding over guard. He loves the elbow himself. I've seen him in a couple of bloody fights, the one against Magomedov, um, the first one, they're both uh, cut open. But <laughs> anytime, anytime you end up talking about cuts and like the um, likelihood of scoring a good cut, you get sort of into race science. <laughs> so bear with me. But uh, Ferdi Pacheco used to be convinced that the level of mel melanin in your skin uh, affected how easily you cut. Uh, you know, the epidermis is what, like 0.7 of a millimeter thick. Um, that's all races, as Bill Bryson said. But. Um, when we're talking about the cut in that 0.7 millimeters, I think maybe you can allow yourself to speculate on uh, on the role of melanin in your skin. Um, but yeah, uh, it is a, a thing. Pasty fighters tend to cut open easier. Uh, and I would love to see... I mean, Jan's game is such that he should be very vulnerable to folding elbows. But then the man loves elbows himself. You know, he loves the clinch. He loves... One of the great things about Jan, and I said this in the Filthy Casuals Guide, one of the thing that I really wanted to hammer home was that he doesn't get tied up. Like, if you watch uh, Aldo versus Pedro Munoz, anytime Pedro Munoz steps in and wants to throw two punches, Aldo just puts his shoulder into the center of um, Munoz's sternum. He doesn't even need to grab him. He just uh, smothers him briefly, and then he might pivot off and slap him with a left hook. He might come back with counters. He might clinch him if he wanted to, but like... That's how easy it is to smother offense normally. If you step in on someone and crowd them, they can't continue punching. And being a good pressure fighter in MMA means you have to be able to break that. You have to be able to stop the guy grabbing you. You have to be able to move and, and keep hitting him. And Jan does that two ways. One is the head post, and, or rather uh, you, creating longer clinches is how I'd describe it. Because a clinch, we think of like chest to chest, the over under, the classic um, wrestling clinch or a body lock. Um, you know, when you're chest to chest, that's a full clinch. A longer clinch is something where you're holding on to each other, but you're not smothering each other. So like the, the collar tie, if you both got one hand on the back of the opponent's head, your elbow is wedged in front of their um, collar bone. And, uh, and that 
keeps you a, a, a little bit of distance from them. And you know that the, like that's why holding and hitting works, because there's a bit of distance between you, but you're still holding on to them. The head post is the same. If you can get your head in front of the opponents, you can move your hips back and start kneeing. You can pull your head away and, and um, hit them with the elbow. And that's the, the secret to Jan's success there. He either gets the collar tie, he gets his elbow inside and grabs the back of the head, or he gets the um, head post. And he does a really good job of pushing the, the opponent's underhook hand down and like freeing himself. Um, but the other thing he does is trips and sweeps. You know, he, he has a decent double leg, but a lot of what he does getting people to the ground is, is hitting really pretty trips and sweeps. And the great thing about trips and sweeps is that if you don't score them, you've still moved the guy and made him pick his foot up and, and stumble a little bit. And you've made some distance. Like the thing with a trip is like if you try and trip someone from a clinch and they start losing their balance, if they hold on to you, they're just going to fall with you on top of them. So what guys will do is like it, they it might not even be a conscious decision, but they'll let go and start trying to balance themselves. And that's where you can start striking again. You know, the, the stop it. Well, both the techniques that knocked Uriah Faber down were a little a, attempt at a Sasai Surikomi Ashi sort of sweep and then an elbow the first time and a uh, punching flurry into a high kick on the way out the other time. But a lot of what we see from Jan is... Um, but my reason for bringing that up is that a lot of what we see from Jan is people closing in on him. I'd be very interested to see him close in on um, Sandhagen. You know, him initiate the clinch. And you can do that. It's interchangeable. Like Matt Brown, sometimes he'd be kneeing the shit out of people because they tried to grab him. Other times they'd be out striking him on their feet and he'd grab a hold of them and start kneeing them. Anyway, um, all of that is to say that this is a, a banger of a matchup. Uh, and I think just stylistically, they make very compelling uh, opponents for each other. All of Sanhagen's issues are going to come if his opponent can start pressuring towards the fence. Uh, all of Jan's issues are going to be if his opponent can start forcing him the cover up and exploiting the the openings that exist off that cover up. You know, so many guys get dragged into just swinging at his head. You know, Uriah Faber is probably the worst example of a guy to fight Piotr Jan because his whole career has been throwing the overhand and then maybe faking the overhand and doing a step up knee, but. No body work, no volume, ne never what we would consider a good technical striker in the modern era of MMA. Just a banger. And that isn't going to work against a guy whose head is concrete um, and, and who, if you after you've thrown your good punch, he's going to come back at you with three more. Anyway, that's enough of that fight. Let's get on to some of these others because otherwise we won't. <laughs> I've done like half an hour on one fight and not really decided who I think is going to win. Um, I would love it. If Sanhagen won, though, because just the anger from Jan and his fan base, if he cannot get the rematch with Sterling, or, or if Sterling beats um, Sanhagen again for the title, it'd be so funny. But that division, oh, it's just popping off. What a great division. But the actual main event is the two old fella 